order and the sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety and we we'll start with listed questions and could I just inform members that question six has been withdrawn. I call Ms Michaela Boyle. Question one. The following two important measures will address the main issues which were raised when I attended the RCN Summit on Emergency Care. We had the opportunity to hear from frontline emergency care practitioners. The Chief Nursing Officer has commissioned work to develop a framework for emergency care nursing. This will include setting key professional standards and developing a career pathway for emergency care nurses. This work will be led by the RCN Emergency Care Network and supported by the Northern Ireland Practice and Education Council, NIPEC. The baseline emergency staffing tool, known as BEST, which is a workforce planning tool, has been developed by the RCN Emergency Care Association and the Faculty of Emergency Nursing. It is being evaluated as part of the delivery care programme. As a result of the summit and in the spirit of collaboration, the RCN Emergency Nurses Network will be a key stakeholder in the College of Emergency Medicine Summit, which I have planned for early April. The learning and key points from the RCN Summit will be incorporated into the next summit. Ms. Michaela Boyle for supplementary. Margaret, can I thank the Minister for his response? And can I ask the Minister further how will he address the recommendations uh, to further increase the staffing levels and to stop uh, closing of beds? Margaret. The Chief Nursing Officer is in the process of commissioning work to develop a framework for emergency care nursing, which will include settling key professional standards and will also include work to develop a career pathway for emergency department nurses. And the work to develop a framework for emergency care nursing will be led by the RCN Care Network. So, through the, the, those programmes um, led by the Chief Nursing Officer, um, we will be seeking to ensure that we have the appropriate number of nurses um, to carry out the jobs that are required of them. And I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers today. Uh, can the Minister give us some details on the BEST, which I understand is a baseline emergency staffing tool, and how it can be drawn down to improve efficiency within the service? Well, it is a workforce planning tool. It has been developed by the RCN Emergency Care Association and uh, the Faculty of Emergency Nursing. And the BEST tool is currently undergoing validity tests to ensure its reliability. The National Institute for Clinical Excellence will include the BEST tool as part of the evaluation of workforce tools, which is expected to be reported uh, in July 2014. And the BEST uh, tool review in Northern Ireland will take account of the NICE evaluation outcome and its evaluation within the current work stream of the normative staff working program which has been developed by NIPAC. Call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thanks, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, you talked about workforce planning and workforce planning, you know, it needs to be planned, managed and resourced. But looking at the wider picture in terms of our nurses, uh, that we're, there's a lot of pressure in the nursing right across, right across the whole sector. What plans are there, there to sort of review the nursing levels right across the hospital sector? These things are, are constantly under review uh, in terms of, of, of the workforce and as things change and as different uh, programs of care change and as nurses take on more and more responsibilities. Uh, where it's identified that there is a need for additional nurses, uh, then those nurses will, will be provided. So I've previously uh, told this House of the increased number of nurses that we have over the course of the last three years that I've held office, and uh, that has been uh, on an upward trajectory. And I think that's something that we in the entire House should be, should be welcoming, that there are more frontline staff in our health service than was previously the case. Andra Overend. Well, Deputy Speaker, and just uh, leading on from that, or, and a slightly twist, uh, specialist nurses can play a crucial role in enabling patients to receive support away from a and &E and without excessive wait to see their GP. Will the Minister be ensuring that the postgraduate nurse training uh, budget is not cut further and instead returned to previous investment levels? Well, what I think is uh, absolutely essential is that we have more and more specialist nurses. And that's a course of work that uh, I have asked 
uh, the Chief Nursing Officer to look at as to identify um, how she can work with the trusts to ensure that nurses uh, have the time uh, allocated to them by the trusts to allow them to, to train up and, and, and further their skill levels. I have just came from a Marie Curie event, for example, and uh, at that event it was, it was told of the great work that nurses do in terms of uh, delivering chemotherapy in their own home, in terms of delivering uh, IV antibiotics and indeed uh, blood transfusions in the home. And uh, the more that we can develop those skills, the less pressure there will be on our hospital system, the less pressure there will be on our emergency departments, and the better standard of care there will be for people. Because they are receiving that care in their own home, it is a much better environment uh, for them. But we can only do it with the requisite right number of nurses, and that is the course of work that the Chief Nursing Officer has to ensure that we have the appropriate trained nurses to do that. Thank you. And Ms. Bronwyn McGahan. Gurmi, I have a question too. I am committed to open the sound transparency about this issue, and I want to see uh, such, in, uh, such information uh, as is possible in the public domain. My officials have been working closely with the Health and Social Care Board and the Public Health Agency to establish what the figures are and what can be published. This involves individually reviewing information on every serious adverse incident. The HASCB has advised me that in the last three years, from January 2011 to December 2013, there has been less than five SAIs regionally where delays in the emergency department may have been a contributory factor. This includes the two confirmed cases that have already been reported in the media and which were identified with a learning letter distributed widely to relevant organisations, including health and social care bodies across Northern Ireland in January last year or this year. These cases have been through the serious adverse incident investigative process. However, the delays identified are not necessarily synonymous with waiting times. They may, for example, arise due to issues around the triage of a patient or around a missed diagnosis. The Department will not publish other actual numbers relating to less than five individual patients in order to protect patient confidentiality. There are a small number of other cases from the same three-year period where the serious adverse incident investigation is still ongoing. These mostly relate to serious adverse incidents reported during 2013. We will need to await the completion of these investigations to determine, to determine whether or not the conclusion is that delay may have been a contributory factor. In the context of the question, I would like to clarify a number of points. Serious adverse incidents cover a wide range of situations and not just death. An SAI is defined as any risk, potential or actual of serious harm which are, where, where there could be learning. Uh, Mr. Speaker, or, uh, if I could have a, a half a minute, thank you. Uh, the reporting of an event uh, of an SAI does not automatically mean that there was a problem with the quality of care provided. For example, from October 1, 2013, there are now mandatory requirements about the reporting of cases of child deaths and cases of suicide if the client has been in contact with health and social care services within the previous 12 months. Suicide also accounts for around one, and one third of serious adverse incidents. The purpose of the SAI system is to ensure that if a serious event or incident occurs, there is a systematic process in place for safeguarding service users, staff and members of the public. This process is a clear, regionally agreed approach for the reporting, management, follow-up and learning from serious adverse incidents. Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn McGahan, for a supplement. I, I thank the Minister for his response. Can I ask the minister to, minister to clarify why he was not made aware of the recent deaths that may have been connected with delays in waiting times, and how will this be rectified in moving forward? Well, I, I wasn't informed because the Trust <coughs> didn't inform me. Um, I, I believe that they should have informed me, and uh, <coughs> I've asked Trust to, to ensure that uh, where such incidents take place, and that we are kept informed of the circumstances. Uh, I think that it is to everybody's benefit um, that we do know if, if things have, have failed in some way uh, so that we can ensure that responses um, are actually carried out and that the responses are very strong. Thank you. Peter Weir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, thank you for responses so far, I am supposed to put this in some context, to ask the Minister how many serious adverse incidents are reported each year in the Northern Ireland Health Service? Well, in terms of adverse incidents, um, there are some 
83,000 uh, reported each year. Um, obviously, there's a smaller number of serious adverse incidents, uh, but as I indicated, the factors relating to serious adverse incidents very often um, have uh, nothing to do with, with the incident uh, leading to the death of the individual, uh, but there are a whole series of reasons um, that that should be included. And uh, we have given a definition of that, and, and, and that's something which is very, very important. So, in terms of serious adverse incidents, uh, I believe that they are a very useful tool for us to identify where best practice may not have been met and where we can seek to improve that. This is an improvement tool that we are using within the system. In uh, December, January to December of 2009, there was 287. Uh, in January um, to April um, 10, there was 75. Across Northern Ireland, uh, over the last year, uh, there was 386. In the previous year, there was 269. In the previous year, there was 243. So they are um, of significance, um, but there are also significant benefits to be derived from the learning. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister, on the basis of those statistics then available to him, uh, to, can he outline whether or not the legal duty to inform the coroner on the same day of any serious incident has been fully adhered to during this time? I understand that um, the hospitals involved have been working closely with the coroner. The duty to report deaths to the coroner is set out in section 7 of the Coroner's Act. Uh, Northern Ireland, 1959, which puts a statutory requirement on every medical practitioner, a registrar of deaths, or funeral director, and every occupier of a house or mobile dwelling, and every person in charge of an institution or premise in which the deceased person died, to report a death to the coroner if it resulted directly or indirectly as a result of violence or misadventure, by unfair means, or as a result of negligence or malpractice on the part of others or from any cause other than natural illness or disease for which the deceased has been seen and treated within 28 days of death, or in such circumstances as uh, may require investigation. It is something that is done urgently, and occasionally, for example, on a bank holiday, it may be the day after that, that, has been, that those are reported, uh, but that is something that um, all of our trusts take very, very seriously indeed. And I call Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The, uh, the figures in terms of serious adverse interest, uh, incidents shows particularly high levels uh, in the Northern Trust and the, the Belfast Trust area. Those are also areas where there are excessive four-hour waits. Does the Minister uh, agree with uh, Dr. Jonathan Miller, formerly of the Royal Victoria Hospital, when he indicated that excessive waits at A&E can contribute to serious adverse incidents? and when will we reach GP levels of four-hour waits? Well, I think that certainly the excessive waits has been something that has fallen and fallen quite dramatically. So just a few years ago, we were looking at um, almost 1,000 people on a monthly basis waiting for over 12 hours, which is now about a tenth of that. So, we take excessive weights very, very seriously, and that's why there has been um, considerable work done to reduce that 12-hour waiting time, uh, which has happened. I've met Dr. Miller. I met him um, quite a while before he went on to the, 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 the TV and discussed the issues with him. And uh, it was after that meeting with Dr. Miller and others from the Royal ED that I, I decided to um, bring the RQIA in to conduct their piece of work. Um, so I took very seriously. Uh, what clinicians say if clinicians raise concerns. Thank you. And I call Mr. Stephen Moodry. Number three, Principal Deputy Speaker. <coughs> work is underway as part of a regional programme to develop a hub and spoke model to facilitate the improved provision of health and social care services in the community. The Southern Local Commissioning Group has identified a Lurgan hub with associated spokes as one of its priorities for inclusion with the next tranche of hubs. These priorities will have to be considered together with the overall regional priorities within the capital programme and the availability of both capital and revenue funding before timing of individual projects can be determined. Thank you. And before I call Mr. Motory for a supplementary, can I remind members that this is a constituency-specific question? 
Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his response. And can I further ask the Minister what assessment he makes of facilities that he visited recently in Lurgan and Donnacloney? Well, I, I welcome the opportunity to, to visit such facilities and uh, to see firsthand the, the conditions that people are operating in. I think if we look at what we propose to do in transforming your care, and you look at some of the facilities that GPs are currently operating in, you very quickly ascertain that they are not suitable um, to meet the, the, the medium to long term needs of the, of the, the health and social care uh, sector. And therefore, we need to be looking at how we can address that issue. That is why uh, you know, the, the, the Southern Trust has identified Lurgan as one of the areas that would be suitable um, to have hubs in place. And there um, you will have a much greater opportunity uh, for people with conditions that they can see a GP who specialises, for example, in dermatology or, or perhaps um, gynaecology or indeed a range of, of, of other things where a specialist GP can actually provide that support in a local community and will avoid people actually attending the hospital. Um, so that is all a key element of transforming your care that we actually look at how we can ensure that the primary care clinics are rolled out across Northern Ireland with a spoke model to support those smaller facilities, but nonetheless very essential facilities uh, in villages such as Donatlone. Mr. Stuart Dixon. This is number four, Mr. President, let me speak here. It's uh, my intention to introduce a draft adoption and children bill in the Assembly in the current mandate. The bill is substantial with 150 clauses and five schedules, and my officials are continuing to instruct Council. Subject to the timely completion of the drafting of the bill, I intend to seek executive approval to consult on the draft bill. With the agreement of the executive, the consultation will commence in July 2014 and finish at the end of September 2014. It is necessary to consult over the summer months to ensure that the bill is introduced within the time scales required to enable its passage through the Assembly in the current mandate. My officials are keeping key stakeholders appraised of developments, including the proposed time scales for consultation. Mr. Dixon, for a supplementary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your response. Minister, can you tell the House what um, the current status is of uh, either unmarried or same-sex couples who are deemed suitable for adoption uh, in the current circumstances? It's as defined by the court decision of, of, uh, of, the, of the, the High Court. Promise. Karen McEvitt. Thank you, um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Given that the consultation on this issue began uh, back in 2006, why does the Minister believe that the progress uh, in this area has been so slow? Well, it's certainly something that I wanted to progress. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Human Rights Commission took a case which went to court and consequently delayed the process of, 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 of this bill. This bill will shorten uh, the time taken to actually carry out adoption. And uh, I think it's hugely unfortunate that this Assembly will not be making law uh, on, in that instance uh, and that the, the, the ability of the Assembly to make that law uh, was taken off them uh, when it came to making the decisions and that the consultation that was carried out will not be reflected um, in the legislation that we will produce uh, because that appears to have been set aside uh, by others. Thank you. And I call Mr Leslie Cree. Question 5, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Executive is committed to closely monitor the financial position across departments over the remaining months of the financial year in order to ensure that any further resource surrenders can, if deemed appropriate, be recirculated towards my department through the urgent procedures process. However, at this stage, my department has not received any additional funding through this process, despite significant internal efforts to reduce and manage expenditure. Our current assessment is that some £21 million is still needed in order to balance the books and ensure that the safety and quality of services can be maintained. Without these additional funds, my department will not be able to live within its budget control totals. I ask all of my ministerial colleagues to urgently provide any additional support that they can to our pressurised health and social care services through declaring further reduced requirements to DFP. In the meantime, I will not support actions nor I would suggest with the wider executive, which compromise patient and client safety and lead to poor standards of care. Mr. Cree, for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that. Um, I know that during the year 
you did receive, due to the heavy pressures, 100 million in additional health funding through the in-year monitoring. I'm just wondering, Minister, there was uh, an allocation for 20 million for inescapable settlements through, or really was arising from clinical neglect. How do you, how do you propose to, to meet those uh, on schedules and on, on bidded monies yet? Well, uh, all of these things are, are, are part of the assessment that has been carried out, and certainly uh, that was something which uh, was, was unforeseen in that we would normally spend around £30 million per year on clinical negligence cases, which is a very large amount of money. Uh, most of these cases are actually historic, and uh, it is something that we have, have to uh, oblige in, in terms of meeting these requirements because uh, it is all set within law. So we have no means of actually reducing uh, the clinical negligence claim, claims that are coming in, uh, which are of historic basis. The best way we can reduce it uh, for future ministers is to ensure that the quality of care uh, is such that there are less clinical negligence claims. And there are some very large claims coming in, very complex cases and people left with very complex conditions and very often families uh, who will have um, a child that has been injured at birth will require uh, that money to provide that support and care for that child for, for its lifetime and therefore it is something that, that uh, we have to, to live with. The number of new cases created and closed for the year to date are in line with 2012-13 numbers which is around 207 but there's been a significant increase in the number of individual cases that have been settled that actually exceed more than half a million pounds. And in 2012-13, eight cases were settled in excess of half a million, as was the case in 2010-11 and 2011-12. However, of the 207 cases that have been settled at this point, 23 cases have been settled at more than half a million pounds, which is one of the reasons that we find ourselves in these circumstances. Ms. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Does the Minister believe that money um, exists in other departments? Um, and if so, when will that money be surrendered? Well, ho hopefully people will be indicating at this point that there may uh, be so some funding um, that uh, they are able to surrender. Uh, 21 million sounds like a lot of money. Uh, on a budget of close to five billion, it isn't an awful lot of money. Uh, so people cannot ex not, not, not blame us for handing money back to, to Westminster. Uh, we're looking uh, to spend the, the, the money that we we'll have because we actually need to spend it to provide that level of service and that level of care. And uh, I have made it very, very clear um, throughout uh, that whatever the financial pressures are, we cannot compromise on quality of care that is provided uh, to the public and that it is important that we continue to challenge the waiting lists and waiting times and ensure that people are, appropriate, are, are, people are treated at an appropriate point um, with the right level of care and support. And, uh, before I call Dolores Kelly, could I just remind speakers and the Minister if they use the microphone? For some yeah. member. Thank you. Mr. Dolores Kelly. Question seven, please. While the number of patients requiring emergency admission has increased by 3.5% over the past five years, we also note the average length of stay for all patients in Northern Ireland has fallen by 13.5% since 2008 9. This change has taken place against the background that acute beds in Northern Ireland were approximately 25% higher than England and were not used as intensively, and lengths of stay were longer. It is essential that the Health and Social Care Trusts ensure that bed capacity is used to the best effect so that patients do not wait ex excessive lengths of times in emergency departments. The HSC has adopted a whole system approach to improve the smooth movement of patients through and out of the hospital with improved internal hospital processes, multidisciplinary team working, an interface between hospital and community services. 
I'll call Mr. Loris Kelly for a supplement. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I don't know whether or not the Minister is aware that from 6 p.m. last night, ambulances were backed up at Craigavon Emergency Department, and uh, 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 staff did not know where patients were going to be admitted to because there have been no beds available in Craigavon Area Hospital for the last number of weeks. Could the Minister not be honest with this Assembly and tell the Assembly that there is just simply not enough money, that the trusts are managing the end of year budgets because because uh, they haven't enough money to open the beds, would the Minister commit to additional funding for Craigavon Area Hospital so that the two wards that are currently closed and are held for winter pressures can be opened actually to meet the need of the emergency department? Thank you. Well, an, an interesting speech from, from the, the member. And, uh, she knows full well that, that the Southern Trust uh, applied for and received more beds um, for winter pressures. Uh, and that is something that we didn't hold off uh, the Southern Trust, nor indeed uh, any other trust. And uh, each trust and each hospital uh, will come under pressure, uh, particularly at this time of the year. And uh, it's important that across Northern Ireland we seek to manage that and ensure that all our trusts will step in and provide support whenever a particular trust uh, is under pressure. I do think, though, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, it would be remiss if we didn't very clearly identify what we're doing uh, in terms of bed management. And there are more and more people, and this can, needs to continue to grow, more people receiving intravenous drugs, uh, blood transfusions, and chemotherapy in their own homes. And that is right, and it works, and it is better care for the patient. And that's why transforming your care is such an important document because it is better care for the patient, first and foremost, as well as addressing the needs of the health service to meet the greater demand that is coming our way and will continue to come our way because we are successfully keeping people living longer and we want to ensure that they get the best possible care um, whilst they are living. Mickey Brady for a supplementary. Um, Pre-Laskin I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, apart from obviously the shortage of beds in Craig Avon, could the Minister detail other areas where there is a shortage of beds, the impact this has on patients' treatment, and how he plans to address this issue? What have I got? Well, I think, for example, we need to look at where there is bed shortages as to whether there are inappropriate usage of beds. And there are certainly trusts that are operating where uh, around 30 per cent of the beds are actually being taken by people who could have been uh, moved into the social care side of things more quickly. And that's very, very important that we address that. Uh, for example, I know that, uh, for example, in the Belfast Trust, more than 20 people were waiting for more than a week to get a bed or, or to, to move out of a hospital bed, and that's an inappropriate usage of beds. So the, I, I would say that the issue isn't the number of beds in the hospital. It is more that we need to improve the social care side of it and the packages that are available uh, to actually have people in their own homes. That's why I was able to tell uh, Mr McCarthy earlier on today that there was 700,000 additional dormicillary hours provided. That was before we got 5 million additional from the Department of Finance and Personnel in January to further support dormicillary care because if we're genuine about wanting to take hospital beds out and care for people in the community, that's what we need to be doing, and that's what we are doing. Commissioner Kieran McCarthy. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, not only is there a shortage of, of hospital beds, but there's also a shortage of uh, capacity in the wards. Uh, how can the Minister uh, defend uh, a constituent of mine being dumped out of a bed into a corridor and remain there for six days during the week, and only whenever I complained? Guess what? He was dismissed home. How can the minister stand and defend what's going on in our a &E hospitals? Well, I think uh, he'll find that, that beds and wards are the same thing, uh, that, that, that beds are, are, are actually, actually uh, part of our, our, our hospital system and, and beds are kept in the wards. We can all identify a particular circumstance where someone didn't uh, receive uh, the appropriate care. I've done it in the past. I hear about it now. We seek to deal with it whenever it arises to us. Hospitals are operating under immense pressure. Uh, we have greater and greater demand. 
We have more and more people using the hospital, uh, our, our, our hospitals, and therefore it's important that we have the right responses, including responses that actually keeps people out of hospitals, keeps them in their own homes where that is appropriate, and provide hospitals without walls. And that is an absolutely superb concept that is coming out of transforming our care. And whenever you talk to people who have used it and who have benefited from it, they are high in their praise for it, and we need to be doing more of that. Uh, I'm sorry, that ends the period for oral questions. Uh, we will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, the Minister, and I'll have to stop meeting like this. This is the third time today. Um, Minister, I would ask you how essential maintenance is planned and monitored to ensure that patients, visitors, uh, are not inconvenienced uh, in our hospitals. Okay, we'll have to stop meeting like this, Mr. Cree. People will be talking, but nonetheless, essential maintenance uh, is something that uh, each trust has responsibility for um, in association with the Health and States Infrastructure Group. Uh, where it becomes more technical, uh, the health estates will become involved. For example, asbestos removal. Um, we we'll had the issue around pseudomonas, for example. So there will be a lot of expertise that exists in there. Uh, in the main, uh, this will be provided by the trust, um, general maintenance, and it is for the trust to, to actually manage that and ensure that it's done in a way which facilitates the general public uh, to access a hospital and ensures that patient care isn't compromised. Uh, but I suspect that I'm going to hear something now. Call Mr. Cree for supplementary. <laughs> yes, Minister. Um, all politics is local. Uh, and in the Bangor Hospital, the sole lift has been out of order for several weeks, and no one can give a date when, in fact, it will be repaired. Is there anything else that can be done to expedite this matter? We will uh, certainly have it looked at. Uh, I know that the lift has been, been, been out, of, out of working order in this building for, for months now, so, so I don't know what's, what's wrong with lift companies that they can't actually ensure uh, that they are fixed quickly. Um, so obviously for people who are accessing facilities, uh, particularly people who have disabilities, that's an important issue, and uh, we'll give Mr. Cree an assurance that we'll come back to him um, on that issue and thank him for drawing it to our attention. Okay, Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, there's news at the minute about the MRI scanner in the Belfast Children's Hospital and the delay really in getting it installed, although your, the officials say that it is a going according to process. Is there anything you can do as Minister to intervene maybe to expedite the situation? Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> I, heard, I heard some of the nonsense on the radio this morning. Uh, I, I'd have to say that um, I thought that the, the chair of the health committee should have informed herself uh, better before she went onto the news or onto the radio. Uh, I think just saying that it's for the minister to answer these questions was, was pretty poor form, um, given the fact that much of this um, would be very made accessible to her very, very easily. Um, there was a business case approval granted in November 2012 um, for the MRI scanner. Uh, I supported the development of an MRI scanner in the Children's Hospital. It wasn't previously uh, part of the plan. And I think that we need to recognize that, uh, you know, people come on the radio, why can you not just install this? We're not installing a 42-inch TV screen. We're installing a very technical piece of, equip uh, of equipment with the best imaging uh, that you can, you, you can gain. And that will involve having the right people in place to actually manage it but also the installation of it is something which is very important. Uh, it will involve piling, which is actually already taking place. It is involving asbestos removal, which is currently taking place. And it will involve actually ensuring that the building that it is in, enclosed in will not impact upon other wards, because we are talking about radioactivity that is taking place in MRI scanners. Uh, and the criticism of the use of, of, of actually the private sector is something which is absolutely bizarre, because we are ensuring that people and continue to get MRI scans through that um, whilst we are providing a, an MRI scanner for the Children's Hospital, which I believe is uh, critically important. Mr Swan, for supplement, thank the Minister for his answer on his commitment and progress in this. Minister, other charities also raise money in support of the Children's Hospital, namely Children's Heartbeat Trust, who refurbished parents' accommodation within that unit, and they have had trouble with the Trust in actually getting that open. Is there anything the Minister can do there to intervene? I'd certainly be very happy to talk to, to, to the, the Charitable Trust about it. Um, I know that 
Uh, for example, for the, the children's hematology unit, there's recently been uh, uh, new houses opened on the Falls Road um, through uh, the, the, I think it's the Northern Ireland Cancer Fund, uh, Children's Cancer Fund, that, that has ra raised the money, and uh, excellent accommodation. And I know, uh, and the, the member knows very well himself, the importance of parents having accommodation whenever you've got a sick child. Um, and the hospitals do provide beds beside children very often, but uh, the importance of having accommodation where one parent perhaps can, can go back to that accommodation and, and have a shower and, and, and rest properly for a few hours and then come back and, and replace the other parent uh, at the bedside of the child is something which is very, very important. So I'm happy to talk to the Heartbeat Trust about that issue. And I know that there's others um, who are interested in developing uh, houses for parents um, to provide that support, which is provided in Birmingham, and I think the member will know um, who and what I'm talking about in that instance. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Good morning, I have the last and call you very much on the same lines as the last uh, question. Can the minister confirm that all the funding is in place for the MRI scanner and how much of it is spent on the private uh, sector? Well, the funding is in place. Uh, £2 million was raised uh, by the charitable organisation. Absolutely tremendous work. Um, I was able to, to more than match that with £2.75 million of public funding uh, and also the commitment to provide the staff uh, to actually man uh, the MRI scanner. Uh, it is good news for everyone whenever the scanner goes in place uh, because the children will be able to get it at the children's hospital as opposed to having to travel over to uh, the, the, the adult hospital. And MRI scanning for children is, is somewhat more complicated because very often children have to be sedated, where adults don't. And uh, consequently, if an emergency comes in uh, at the adult hospital uh, and they're displaced and, and the child has already went through this, uh, a sedation process, then uh, that is something which is very negative because they have to be sedated a second time. Um, so in the interest of our children, I think it's critically important that we do this. Uh, and I also think that it will be beneficial to the main hospital because it will not have to um, scan children and therefore will have more MRI uh, slots uh, for adults. So it's a win-win uh, for both hospitals by installing the scanner. Sean Lynch for questions. Um, Gold and and Fragrish. Can the Minister give, give an outline of a timeline for the scanner to be in operation? Yeah, the, the, it is intended to go out... Um, for the main contract for the construction in, in June of this year, uh, with the commencement of, of the work um, for the, that the element of, of the development in August, uh, and for completion of the MRI suite, as expected at the end of March uh, 2015. Specific, specifications for the actual equipment are currently being prepared by the Trust Radiologists in conjunction with the Medical Physics Agency and it's been planned to procure this off a PALS call-off contract in time to facilitate installation in February March 2015 prior to handover. I should say that in terms of acquiring scanners, the equipment improves constantly. It's one of those areas like, uh, like computers where the equipment is, is always improving. Uh, so uh, we're better to have the building in place and, and that element of the work done before we finally uh, identify exactly what we need for the, sc the scanner. Um, to have the two things coming simultaneously. And a comment to Stephen Moutry. Thank you. Uh, can I ask the Minister to indicate how allied health professionals can help de deliver transforming your care? Allied health professionals are a critical element to de developing uh, transforming your care. So, for example, this morning I was talking about how an occupational therapist was helping in the reablement program. Um, we can look at things like our, our, our allied health professionals like podiatrists um, who are hugely beneficial in terms of falls management and in terms of helping old, older people stay on their feet. Uh, we're looking at people like physiotherapists um, who can do so much to help with respiratory conditions and support the GPs. So allied health professionals are a key element to, to, to delivering transforming your care. Mr. Mudry for a supplement. I'm going to thank the Minister for his response. Can I further ask him how does the number of allied health professionals compare with whenever he took up office? Well, uh, over the course of, of the last two and a half years, we have been able to appoint an additional 
um, 300 allied health professionals. As I indicated, they're absolutely critical to providing good quality care. I actually think they provide uh, very good value for money. They're considerably uh, more cost effective, perhaps, uh, th th than doctors. And they offer a, a different kind of service and can reduce the, the pressure that's being applied on, on hospitals, on consultants, and a lot of other people's times. Um, they can reduce the, 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 the amount of surgery that needs to take place in some instances. Uh, and all in all, um, we are delighted that we have that extra 300 allied health professionals out there in the system because they're making a real uh, tangible difference. Thank you. And call Mr. Barry Mickledoff. Gorham, I've got a free of last can call you. I'm aware of the five tranche one hub projects in primary care mentioned earlier today by the Minister, but could I ask the Minister how close is his department to identifying or securing funding to meet the capital or accommodation requirements of more rural health centres, including places like Carrick Moor and Fintna in my own constituency of West Rhone where there is real need? I thought Carrick Moore might get a mention, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and, and the, the member didn't uh, let us down. Uh, in, in all of this, there's a course of work that is being done, and I would hope to report to the Assembly, um, hopefully, certainly within the next couple of months, um, or hopefully sooner, uh, on, on where we are on, on all of this. And uh, if, if we can't deliver things in, in a shorter time scale, uh, we need to develop that into the next comprehensive spending review and identify that it is a priority and, and that we're going to spend fun funding on primary care because, uh, as I go back, if you're genuinely going to deliver transforming your care, you need to be supporting uh, the primary care practitioners with the appropriate facilities to carry out the work that we're asking them to do. Barry Duff for supplementary. Thank you. Uh, can call you. Thank the Minister for his answer and for his commitment in this area. But can I ask the Minister, uh, he has identified that there is an issue of physical accommodation restricting or hampering GPs and nurses in communities from doing more. Uh, can I ask the Minister, what level of communication is there at this time between the department, between the trust, between GPs to address this issue? Trusts are all doing courses of work <coughs> with local communities. So for example, we are building uh, the, the, the new primary care facility in Oma, which um, I know will be well used and supported um, by the local community in conjunction with the local hospital. And that will be the hub. Uh, but it's important for the hub to work effectively to have the spokes going out um, to, to, to places like Carrickmore and Fintan and indeed other areas uh, to provide that support at the local level so that we can have um, the general practitioner or indeed the allied health professional who is based in Oma, uh, perhaps travelling one day a week to, to, to places uh, like Carrickmore and Fintana uh, to deliver that care that's needed in, in, in that particular community. Uh, so that is the concept of the model. I think it's a good concept, uh, but the member rightly points out that if it is to work properly, we need to have the facilities for those people to work in. If GP facility is, is, is very cramped, um, there's very little consulting space, um, then you can't bring uh, considerable numbers of additional people to offer uh, a further range of services, uh, and that is certainly something that needs an element of it that needs to be addressed. Thank you, Ms. Sandra Overend. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. In a question to the Office of First and Deputy First Minister on the 24th of February, I was informed uh, that. Uh, that that department, instead of taking responsibility for a cross-departmental uh, strategy for internet safety that they had written to the health minister asking him to do so, can the minister inform us of his decision and if he will do this? Well, internet safety is obviously something which is of vital importance to all of us, um, particularly uh, for our younger population. And uh, it is something that uh, we, we will look at and it's something that we, we, we will carry out work on uh, because it is vitally important that um, both children and their parents are well informed about internet safety, uh, about the issues of predation that takes place uh, on the internet, um, about the challenges uh, that is out there uh, for our children and young people and what to avoid. And of course, parents have a key role in that. So very often, whenever our younger people um, are engaging on the internet, um, who are uh, engaging with people that they don't previously know, uh, they're putting themselves at risk. Uh, but parents are very often oblivious of that risk. And if parents 
were to see an older person talking to their child um, along the side of the road or whatever, they'd be very quick to ask information about what was that person talking to you about and what were you doing. But an awful lot of this, this is happening in a child's own bedroom, and the parent knows nothing about it. They're completely oblivious to it. So <clears throat> in all elements of, of Internet safety, I think it is something that uh, we all in government, uh, as, as, as an entire government, need to take very, very seriously. We in the Department of Health will certainly take our side of it very seriously uh, and seek to respond to it uh, in any way we can. Uh, time is up.